Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone, including those who are watching via the WGBH live stream. Welcome to the Museum of Science, to this community conversation about the coronavirus. I am Tim Ritchie, the museum's president. And on behalf of our staff and our board of trustees, I'd like to say that the Museum of Science is committed to be a place where this community can get trustworthy information on science and technology. We do that every day in our Gordon Current Science and Technology stage, and today's conversation is an extension of that commitment. I'd like to thank the museum's staff for pulling this event together so quickly, our panelists and moderator who are giving so generously of their time and expertise, and WGBH, our long-standing community partner and one of the world's foremost translators of science and technology. Today is International Women's Day, a day we celebrate the contributions that women have made and continue to make to our world. It is, it is fitting on this day to remember that the world we create is the product of three things. The underlying facts that we face, the ideas we bring to those facts, and the choices we make. The facts that we face today about the coronavirus are still coming into view. We will explore those facts with our panelists. The ideas that we bring to those facts are the bedrock ideas that underlie this institution. We live in a knowable universe. We have the capacity to understand the world within us and the world around us. Science solves problems, and we can face the problems that we are facing right now. We can solve them. And this leaves us with a choice. Will we live our lives and make our decisions in light of the facts that we are facing and the science that we know? That is, are we committed to living evidence-based lives and building evidence-based communities? With these questions in mind, I'd like to turn the conversation over to our moderator, Arun Roth, the host and editor of WGBH News's All Things Considered, and to our panel of experts. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for coming out here. This is, this is a wonderful uh, event to have all of you here for. We have some very distinguished panelists here. And uh, I, I feel excited about this because not just as a journalist, but I'm someone who lives here in this area. And I have a lot of questions about this. And I have the luxury right now of, of being able to ask some of the smartest people uh, available about that. And you have a luxury as well. There is a, a, an app that we're going to be using, that uh, you can get your questions to me. And I have this, uh, this tablet up here. So if you submit those questions, there's also some voting on it as well. So if, if there is a question that gets a lot of votes, it'll go right to the top of my list here. Pretty much from the moment I'm starting this, I'm going to be looking at your questions so we can get them involved right away. So think about what you want to ask, get them in there. And uh, we're very excited to have you. Uh, join us for this. Let me, let me introduce our, our, our panelists right away. Uh, first off, uh, Nahid Bhadelia. She's a, a, a medical doctor, the director of the Special Pathogens Unit, and associate professor of the section Infectious Diseases at Boston University School of Medicine and National Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratories. Thank you so much. We have with us Jennifer Lowe, uh, Dr. Jennifer Lowe. She's the medical director of the Boston Public Health Commission. And Dr. Larry Madoff, he's the medical director of the Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Thank, thank you all. Uh, so I want to dive right into questions ab about this. The, the, the one thing that I'll, I'll say about this is that, uh, you know, I, I'm a journalist. This isn't a news report. This is a community forum. This is for all of us to better understand what's happening about this disease, this public health situation in our community right now. Uh, and 
I do have to say that one of the things that is unique about this uh, as a public health crisis and situation is that there is a degree of misinformation and politicization which has happened which none of us have ever seen before in a situation like this. Fortunately, I think we can cut through this by the fact that we are going to be focused on our local situation here. We don't need to get into uh, breaking down what has gone wrong necessarily at the federal level. We want to talk about information about what's happening right now. Uh, so we might get into things that are, are will touch upon controversial issues, but it's all going to be with an eye towards getting all of you and all of us the kind of information that we need right now, this Sunday, where we are in greater Boston and Massachusetts with, with, with this. So first off, since we learn new things about this virus, it's incremental literally every day. Uh, I want to start just sort of quickly running through the basics about what we know about this disease right now. And I'm going to have this open to all of you. Uh, there are overlapping areas of knowledge, but let's keep it relaxed and everybody can jump in. And uh, as, as, as you like, remember you have your, uh, your, your microphones here. We'll, we'll need those uh, from you. Uh, so first off, again, the, the, the very basics. Um, how does this disease present itself first in an infected person? What are the symptoms you see? Um, so I'll get, get us started, and then I'm really hoping uh, Jennifer and, and Larry will add to this. So what we know about this disease, majority of it now comes from both China but other countries that are seeing sustained transmission. Um, what we know is that this is a new virus. Um, it is a virus that likely jumped from an animal host and is now infecting humans. And so uh, the details, many details of, of the virus are still missing, but we know the basic amount, which is that in most people, it presents, uh, even though it's not like, it's not exactly like the flu, it presents with flu-like symptoms. That means that people who have it can have a fever and have a cough. In fact, those are the two main symptoms that a lot of people um, that have been getting sick with it in China and other places have noted, uh, followed by body aches. Um, you just feel a bit more run down, but you will, majority of the people who come in have a fever. And how long does it take when someone is infected? What's the incubation period, the period from when they're exposed to when they might show symptoms? Uh, I, um, so the incubation period is um, thought to be around four to five days. I do want to add specifically about transmission that you um, asked about earlier. Uh, it is a respiratory um, virus, and so there's a, been a lot of confusion about the difference between respiratory and airborne. If someone has coronavirus and is in the same room but 20 feet away, am I going to get it from them? Very specifically, the respiratory virus means you have to be in close contact within six feet of the person who, in, who is infected. It's not something like, I don't know, Legionnaire's disease, which would get into like the air system and, and circulate around. It doesn't, it's not live and active out there like that. that. That's correct. I, I, I'm sorry, we'll be doing the questions through, uh, through the app as, as, as we go along, so we don't have microphones that we can get out. So, uh, the uh, six feet is about, uh, I guess I'm about six feet, so about from here to here. <laughs> the, um, and and uh, this I know is a, is a crucial question. Uh, before people are showing symptoms, can they transmit this virus? Do, do we know that? So you've hit on a, a really important and I would say as yet unanswered question. And I think uh, you know one of the things that I wanted to, to add to what uh, Nahid and, and Jennifer have already said is that this virus is only, we've only known about it for about two months now. And so the amount that we know is remarkable, but there are still so many things we don't know for sure. And I think that's one of the questions we don't yet really know the answer to. Um, can people transmit it before? Um, the onset of symptoms. I think um, uh, I think Tony Fauci said this at early in the uh, early in this outbreak, and I think it's really true. Um, however, it's spread. We we know that a, what respiratory viruses are most spread by people who are symptomatic. That coughing and sneezing are the ways that that respiratory viruses spread. And even if there are uh, maybe occasional cases where people can spread it before they have symptoms, the important mechanisms of spread are based on, on symptomatic people. And, and, and in terms of an infectious disease, we, we talked about the symptoms being generally flu-like, but where does this fall on the spectrum of viruses, say from like seasonal influenza to some of the newer novel SARS-like viruses that we, we've, we've seen more recently? 
So um, there are a lot of ways of comparing viruses. I mean, one of the things that this virus has in common with many viruses um, is its zoonotic origin, like, like influenzas, like SARS, like the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, the other two kind of major coronavirus pathogens that, that, that have caused um, global outbreaks. Um, and they are RNA viruses, which means that they are quite mutable, that they, they can change and evolve quickly. And I think that's an important feature of many of the emerging viral pathogens that we see. Um, there are other ways that we can compare viruses. How quickly can they spread? How, how transmissible are they? Um, people talk about um, an, an R0 or R0 value, which is a, a measure of how many people on average will get, a, get an infection from somebody who has it. And um, this infection is not unlike um, influenza in that respect. It has an R0 of about two, two, maybe two and a half. And so it's fairly transmissible. If it's greater than one, that means that an outbreak will spread. And um, if it's less than one, then it will stop spreading. It'll eventually come to an end. So we know that it's transmissible. And then I guess severity is the other thing. And again, um, we don't completely know the spectrum of illness with this virus yet. How many people are infected without symptoms? Um, and, and that's a really important unknown at this point. That, that brings us to, uh, unfortunately, one of the first areas where there's been a bit of uh, controversy, and that's the, the mortality rate uh, with this disease. And I'm wondering if, if all of you can talk to what we know about the mortality rate and what the margin of error is, what, why there might be some confusion ab ab about it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I've worked in many different types of health systems, ones that are really well blessed, such as ours, where we have a lot of hospitals that are equipped and those that are not that well equipped. Um, you know, a lot of times we look at mortality, you know, the idea that if a person gets infected, what are their chances of dying from that disease? And, and that, and, you know, Jennifer and, and Larry will add to this, is a function of the disease itself, the virus, which we're concentrating on a lot, but it also depends on the person. What are their vulnerabilities? You know, what other uh, medical conditions do they have? What's their age and immune system like? But the thing that I think we sometimes miss is that it's also dependent on the health system in which they find themselves. Mm. Um, and the reason why that's important is, well, one of the, one of the diseases in that you know that I've worked with in the past with patients is uh, Ebola virus disease. And Ebola is a disease that when, was, when we saw very few people with this disease since 1976 when it was um, first discovered, it was thought to have a mortality of 90%. And then as we got to see more patients with it, and more patients came into um, contact with better health systems with this disease, we realized that with good care, even without targeted therapies, people's mortality could drop below 20%. And so what I, I say all of this because I think as we learn about diseases, our understanding of mortality changes because we find out the whole gamut of the type of, type of presentations that people have. So how many people are actually getting sick with this disease matters, and we don't yet know that number. Um, my sense is that we will discover that the mortality rate uh, of this disease is probably lower than what it appears to be right now in reality, but we don't yet know. Do you agree with that? Hard to comment. Sure. sure. It's, um, it, you might think that you could just take the number of people who have died, divide it by the number of people who we've counted that have the disease, and that would be the mortality rate. But um, it. it, it the problem, there, there are several problems with that. First of all, we don't know how many people have actually had the disease because, as I say, many people may have had it asymptomatically or mildly um, that we haven't even counted in that number. The other thing is that um, as, as time goes on, um, the people who, it takes time to, to get the infection, to get sick with it, to go to the hospital and, and to, to either survive or, or succumb. And so the time, um, the, the, that time interval can also affect the apparent mortality rate. I'll just add that, um, again, it, it is unknown, but one of the things that we do know is the, the effect of the vulnerable populations. Um, so right now we know that older adults are more vulnerable, people with chronic medical conditions. If you look at today, at the US uh, mortality rate, it's actually quite high, and that is unfortunate because 
the cluster that occurred in Washington State was in a long-term care facility where there were people who are known risk. So it, it looks, but of course, it's just a picture in time. You know, so we, we have to wait to get more information. Yeah, and I get asked this a lot, what's the mortality of this disease compared to influenza? And I think with what we know now, it does look to be higher mortality. I mean, that's a very static number, as Larry said. We're still learning about this disease, but it does appear to be higher than influenza. What else uh, don't you know about, about this disease? I mean, what, what is the research, what are the data that, that would be most helpful to you that you don't have right now? Well, I'll, I'll speak to one of the really important and I think unanswered questions is um, what does this um, infection do to children? Because um, children have been um, notably absent from the cases that we've counted so far. In, in China, um, less than 1% of the people who were affected by the virus were, were young children. And that's unusual. That would certainly be very different from flu and from many viruses. And so the question is, are, are children not getting this infection for some reason that we don't know? Or are they just less susceptible to the effects of it, don't get sick with it? And we've seen that with other viral illnesses also, that, that kids get the infection but don't show any signs of it. And it becomes apparent when, when their parents get it. Because the, the children can be carriers, we're assuming? Well, carriers would be one way of putting it, but really just um, have a mild or, or, or inapparent infection. In, com in comparison to flu, for instance, uh, young children under the age of two, definitely certainly under the age of five, are... Sorry, in comparison to flu, um, under the age of two, definitely they are at higher risk of, of the mortality and, and uh, morbidities related to flu. So we don't see that in, the, in coronavirus. And again, at the, the uh, other end of the age spectrum, it's uh, individuals over the age of 60 that, that have the uh, are, are greater morbidity rates? Yes, and, the, and, and it really climbs sharply with age. So, you know, we first, with, with, with people young, under the age of 60, the apparent mortality is pretty low, actually. And then above the age of 60, it begins to climb, and certainly above the age of 80, um, it becomes pretty high. And that's, that's what we've learned, at least from the large populations in China. And again, how that will play out in other um, parts of the world remains to be seen. And then in terms of uh, research that's needed that can help us develop some way to respond more effectively to this, the kind of things that we need the research community to continue working on, and they're already doing that, is finding quicker, um, rapid diagnostics, ability to diagnose patients even closer to bedside at the hospital, um, and of course, vaccine and treatment. Um, there currently is a randomized control trial testing one of the drugs uh, that NIH has already started, and it's currently at UNMC and some of the other hospitals, um, and as well as vaccine trials. As, and as, as far as, te as, as testing goes, as of Friday, when I was last on the air talking about this, I, I believe here in Massachusetts, the tests there were tests here, but then they would need to be sent to the CDC for, for confirmation. Is that, is that still the...? Right. So early on in the outbreak, the CDC developed an assay, um, and the testing was really only available um, in Atlanta through the CDC. Um, in the last couple of weeks, that testing has been rolled out to state public health labs, and currently in Massachusetts, the state public health lab is the only place where that testing is done. That's out in Jamaica Plain. Um, very shortly, we, we, we hear and we hope that commercial vendors are going to have this test available. So a big diagnostic laboratory companies like Quest and LabCorp are going to have that testing available, which would be, then be available to um, every clinician. I want to talk more about testing, but as, as we get into talking about uh, best approaches and, and practices here for ourselves and, and what we're doing, one thing, because I know people have been asking this online and even before uh, uh, we, we, we gathered here, uh, so let me just skip right to this question, and that's about public gatherings. Uh, as as, as we, we sit here in a public gathering, uh, well, we, obviously we haven't had any, any instruction from public health authorities that we shouldn't be doing this, otherwise we wouldn't be. Uh, but as people are asking here, should we, should we be doing this? Should we be concerned about uh, gathering together like this? Uh, at this time, we are not uh, just, we are not um, encouraging cancellation of large public gatherings. Otherwise, none of us would be here, as you pointed out. I think one of the um, issues is uh, how are we informing our participants 
that come to these gatherings about basic good hygiene. Uh, and that's really the message about containment and control of this virus is, are you washing your hands? If you are sick, if any of you have a fever or cough, I think you need to leave as soon as possible. And I mean, I think that's true. Don't go to these public gatherings. Um, wash your hands frequently. I see many um, alcohol rub uh, dispensers around the building. So it's, it's, the gathering, of course, is one of those containment measures that we can, t mitigation measures that we can take if, if the outbreak proceeds to be more widespread. But just in terms of your day-to-day -day life, it's, uh, the onus is on us as individuals to really be cognizant of how we are, are communicating our, our daily germs to others that are next to us. Yeah, and I think you might agree with this, Jennifer. That picture may change if, if we see more cases, more community transmission. And, and at that point, one of the important questions that we'll have to ask is individual to each of us making a risk assessment. If you have medical conditions, um, you know, if you're someone who might get sick and might have worse outcomes, um, you should do a risk assessment of whether you should go to public gatherings or not. I'll just add one more thing. We as public health officials will make that statement if we feel that it is warranted to protect the public health. I, I can uh, actually give you sort of a real-time scenario that, that's happening, because as, as the three of you know, just as we were getting ready to uh, come on the stage, I, I was getting some uh, texts and emails that uh, I, where I live, Lexington, uh, we've had our, our first um, not confirmed but reported uh, uh, case. This is actually uh, a parent at the uh, elementary school where my daughter goes. I, I'm okay being here. Nobody told me that I shouldn't come or any, anything like that. And, and there, the message was that um, we should, we, we're still going to be going to school tomorrow. Things are going to be okay. But um, how worried should I be as, as a parent right now about sending my, my kid to school tomorrow? Or, or what, what should my concerns be? So I guess I would say that the it, public health takes every case seriously, and we we look into every situation on uh, you know as a as a, as an individual basis, and try to look at the the risks involved. Um, you know, this is a parent, not a kid, who has the illness. Um, there's there's a, a an incubation period. So if we know about a case, we identify the the contacts of that case. This is something that's part of everyday public health for not just coronavirus, but for you know, measles and salmonella and um, every other kind of infectious disease that we, we, we do identify cases, do contact tracing, and quarantine or isolate people is, a, is an important public health tool. And so, you know, this, this person will be isolated, which is the word that we use for people who are sick, separating them from the general public so that they don't pose a risk. And then we, we, we take people who aren't sick but could, could get, come down with the illness and become contagious later, we, we isolate them and we call that a quarantine. So when a person isn't sick and they're also separated, they're, they're quarantined. And I presume that would be the case for, for the children, the close contacts of, of, a, of any given case. They would be taken out of school before they could, could pose a risk. And so, um, you know, a school closure is most likely not necessary given that situation, given that scenario with a lot of assumptions going into that clearly. And I would add that, you know, schools and school systems make their own decisions about that. That's some, something that happens all the time. So nice to be able to have you right here to ask you that. <laughs> Let me also ask, uh, we're getting a lot of questions about this, and it's something that my family has also uh, been thinking about as, as well. We understand that we are low risk here in Massachusetts, but uh, we're a very international place. We're, we're a, a place where a lot of, pe a lot of us travel. Uh, people are asking about, what about my summer plans? What, what about sending the kids to camp? What about you know, uh, making a trip to Europe? Should I be putting those plans on hold? Um. This has been an astounding time because of the rapidity at which information has been shared and the changes. Um, I, I say this without joking, I'm not sure what was gonna happen tomorrow, let alone summer vacation. And so, and I think that is one of the disconcerting things about this is that people do feel a lack of control, this unknown. And so I think it is, it's, 
it behooves us as, as just individuals to say, you know, what do I need to make sure that my family's safe now, my, I'm, I'm safe, and I'm protecting the community. And I, for planners, that is, is not the greatest answer, but I, I, it's, it just changes. It changes very quickly. Yeah, one thing that I've seen is that some of the airlines are now allowing refunds. Um, and so I would, if you're planning, making plans, that's one thing to check is to make sure that the airlines are allowing that because I think that's a useful tool, not knowing what next week or next month might bring. And I, I would just say there are very good information sources out there and um, both the federal authorities, so the CDC and, and the State Department have issue, regularly issue guidance on travel and areas that are at risk and areas that aren't at risk. and and try to grade that risk according to the perceived amount of, um, of infection that's going on in a given location. So those are good, reliable sources of information. I'll, I'll ask you another specific personal one again. For instance, uh, uh, my, my uh, young son was going to be going on a trip to Europe this summer, and we decided we don't know, not to a country that's had any reported cases, but not knowing what things are going to be like in July, the idea of him maybe being out Getting into a quarantine area just felt like didn't seem like a good a good risk. Do you uh, do we make the right call? <laughs> Is that something you're comfortable saying? I bought my ticket to go abroad this summer. So. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? If summer vacation comes around and the situation is still at risk, I will change them. Um, I, I do want to talk more about things we can do ourselves to prepare. But, but Jennifer, if you can talk, all, all of you as well, but about from a, as someone who thinks about public health, obviously this is a new virus, but part of your job is to sort of be ready for the unexpected. What has been going on here across the state to, to get ready for a situation like this? I'll, I'll speak specifically to Boston and then Larry can speak to the rest of the state. Um, so when we were aware, you know, this has been in the news, uh, the changes in China and abroad have been in the news for quite some time. So we sit, set up an incident command structure in early in late January, before any cases came to Boston or the state of Massachusetts. And what um, incident command means is, is basically the structure to um, identify communications, um, to um, identify resources that are needed in preparation for an outbreak or cluster or any sort of positive cases that we need to take care of in Boston. And although that sounds very, you know, it doesn't sound as important. Structure is extremely important in unknown situations like this. It helps us identify um, communication to reduce confusion, to reduce the redundancy, and to increase efficiencies. So that was the first thing that we did. And um, it actually, we set it up about three days before we got our first case in Boston. So it really uh, helped with communications to the public, as well as uh, communications across our, our um, institution. I'll also just mention that we have an Office of Public Health Preparedness, and I, I see their table over here. Um, this is what they do for a living. They, we have um, participated in many exercises and communications with our partners at uh, hospitals as well as, as, as Massachusetts Department of Public Health. We practice for this. I mean, we have what they call table talk exercises. We have monthly meetings. It's, it's very much about coordination, uh, coordination for um, what happens. So, as an example for Boston Marathon, um, the Boston Marathon, we elevate our preparedness for that months before the Boston Marathon because we know this is coming. But we also have exercises and plans for situations for the unknown, such as this. What are some of the events uh, coming up that you're starting to think about right now over the next several months? Uh, well, uh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade is in a couple weeks, and the Boston Marathon is in five or six weeks, so we are still in discussions with that. No, no final decisions have been made on any of those. And, and when I say no final decisions, it means that the events are still going on. I would just back up and say that um, situational awareness is really important, and knowing what's happening not just in, in Massachusetts, but in the world. Um, I work for an organization called ProMed, the Program for Monitoring Emerging Diseases, and their job is to provide early warnings of situations like this, and they, they did that in this case, just even before the, the first of the year, they were, they were announcing that this pneumonia cluster was appearing in China, and that kind of warning helps us prepare. The earlier you have those warnings, the earlier you can begin 
preparation for a particular situation, the better off you are and actually the, the more of an impact you can have. That's a, a, a really important principle. And um, another aspect that I want to emphasize is that um, this is not the first time that the three of us have met. And they, they say that a, a, a crisis is a bad time to be exchanging business cards. And so having ongoing regular communications with our international partners, our federal partners, our local partners, our healthcare facilities is part of, of what we do at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And so that's, that's so important in being, being prepared for when a situation arises. So at the healthcare facility, facility level, one of the things that we're doing is actually it mirrors similar to what Jennifer said, the city is doing. Uh, a lot of hospitals around you have activated their own instant command center to ensure that with new incoming information that we are getting the best strategies into place, hospitals are making sure that clinics and emergency rooms are ready to receive if we get a larger number of people who are sick, uh, ready to receive a larger number of people and to provide care safely and to train, healthcare workers are trained to take care of this, but to retrain healthcare workers and give them the resources that they need to take care of patients. One concern is that if there are more cases, you may see more people who are sick requiring more medical care. So another aspect that hospitals are working on is making sure that they have surge capacity worked out in terms of how patients will get the best quality of care, um, even if there are more cases that come through. Something that I know that all of you are aware of and have dealt with is that there, are, there can be certain communities disadvantaged or disempowered communities that, that don't have the same health care outcomes, uh, have worse healthcare outcomes. Specifically in a case like this, we're dealing with an infectious disease outbreak, what are some of the things, the challenges that you face in, in that regard? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention this specifically. Um, you know, one of the comments that has been made is, should we close public schools if there is a parent? And I, I want to um, point out that in, in Boston, I can speak for Boston, many of the youth in Boston Public Schools receive breakfast and lunch at the school. And so to close a school or to close any organization that provides those services to um, the children has a tremendous impact on their health and well-being. So when the decision to close a school or any organization that provides services to these vulnerable populations, we need to be really conscientious of what that impact means. So we, we do not make these decisions lightly because there's repercussions. And I think that is true of any organization that serves um, vulnerable populations. We have been in communication with homeless shelters specifically for this. How are, we, how are homeless shelters addressing this population? Long-term care facilities that serve our elder population and those with chronic medical conditions. So, um, yeah, we, we do need to be prepared because there are people who don't just get illness, can get very, um, can get very sick from this and can have other risk factors, not illness, but poverty that can be dr dramatically affected um, by this disease. I, I would just add, um, uh, Dr. Lowe mentioned the, the homeless. Our, our commissioner, as well as Dr. Lowe, um, uh, came from um, the, the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless organization. And um, I know that's really foremost in her mind is equity and access to health care, access to health care services, access to public health is really, um, you know, one of the pillars of, of, of our department and really an emphasis. So it's something that we are aware of and think about every day with regard not to just to this situation, but to other public health issues. So someone is uh, asking, and there are also vari variations on the same question. Uh, my question is, how do we prevent fear-mongering and racism in response to COVID-19? And, and there have been some you know, cases of, we've heard of, of uh, Asians and Asian Americans uh, uh, that, that have encountered issues, that there have been people, I guess, concerned about Chinatown or things that don't quite make sense. As, as people who deal with public health, how do you deal with that side of, of it? Or first, maybe make, make some disclaimers about what, <laughs> you know, ab about this disease and... and uh, I would just say that there's a long history of this, um, you know, going back, you know, as early as there have been um, outbreaks, there's been a, an attempt to, you know, cast blame on certain populations, to stigmatize, to close borders, to, um, to, to, to demonize um, people who are often, uh, often victims themselves. 
and uh, it's something that I think we really have to work to avoid. And um, this has just been another example of that situation. It's something that we need to work hard to avoid. Yeah, and I, I think it's so interesting. I think it's important to underline that we live now in an age where we're going to keep seeing new viruses develop. I think most scientists would say that you know we're at higher risk because um, we're seeing so much more change in our environment. There's a bigger population. We are putting a bigger strain on resources. And so diseases can arise anywhere. Um, as you may remember, H1N1 that occurred in 2009, 2010, there was a big epidemic of that here in the United States. And we actually exported cases to other places. Um, and so understanding that we're all globally linked, and, and this is sort of a, almost a Russian roulette in a way that we have to understand what the science is and act with that in mind. Because the one thing you know, communicable diseases don't care about is they don't care about your background. They don't care about your political beliefs. You know? and, and honestly, it is one of those situations where tr we truly are in this together. Because what I do to protect myself protects you. But what, you, what I do to protect you helps keep me healthy because it reduces the number of cases in our community. Uh, we really are in this together. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that you know, it, is, it is very easy to act out of fear and to try and say, okay, who's at risk? Who's, at, you know, who's, who's carrying that disease? Who's carrying that virus? And I think, um, you know, obviously, people can look at me and say, you're an Asian American person, I, you know, you have the disease. And, and it's, it's, it's out of fear, and I understand that it is, it's a very concerning issue, but I think it is our responsibility, as you say, to really just think about how am I protecting myself, um, and that you give the benefit of the doubt. I mean, we are trying to all work as a community to, to protect each other, so to not stigmatize. Uh, getting a number of questions about, we, 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 we had talked earlier about, say, gathering in public places when you should keep home or keep away, but can we talk in a bit more detail about, about that? Uh, when should you stay home? Like cough, cold, fever? When should you keep yourself away from other people? So, you know, I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, we talk about community mitigation and the things that you can do at a community level um, to protect the, the whole population from illness. And, um, you know, we talk about closing schools and, and mass gatherings, and, but, but the mitigation really starts at the level of the individual and, and staying home when you're sick, staying away from other people so that you don't spread illness is just so important. And those, those, those measures that we talk about so that you're all bored, washing your hands and covering your cough, um, are, are, are also just so important, not just for protecting yourself, but from protecting those around you. That's where those kind of community mitigation strategies start. And then they move into, uh, you know, into, into larger groups and other, other mechanisms of controlling things. But, but the, those, those individual level things. So staying home when you have a flu-like illness um, is so important, and it protects not only against um, coronavirus, but, but the flu and other the, the, the respiratory viral infections that are actually common. And uh, then if you're staying at home, how long should you stay away from people until you're not having the symptoms anymore? Again, that's one of the things that we don't know yet about coronavirus is how long people are infectious for. So currently, we're actually um, testing people until they test negative for the virus. But I think that's, that's likely to change. As we learn more, we'll be able to say that the infectious period is so long or, or until you're not symptomatic plus some period of time for a margin of safety. For flu, we know for influenza that, that staying, that once you no longer have fever, um, 24 hours after that is enough time. But we don't know the answer for, for this virus yet. And then if you suspect you might actually, these symptoms seem like this COVID-19, what do you do? Call your healthcare provider. I, you know, and I, I wanted the advice that being a physician to many patients who do have m many medical conditions, one advice that I give them is first do everything you can to stay healthy. Make sure you get the flu vaccine. Um, make sure that you refill your medications and you take your medications because uh, it doesn't matter what you come into the emergency room with. If you're coming into an emergency room and there are many cases in a particular area, uh, you're also potentially at risk because you're in a large group of people. And so 
keeping yourself healthy, all the things that Larry talked about, washing our hands, you know, coughing in our elbows, um, cleaning the environments around us to ensure that we don't transmit the disease to others in our families, in our workplaces, and staying home. But call your provider if you're sick, particularly somebody who, uh, you are somebody who might have medical conditions. It's an interesting uh, question. Uh, uh, this person writes, in Massachusetts, it is legal to penalize food service workers for calling out sick. I, I can't fact check that. But they ask, what is being done to protect those workers in the public in case they get sick so they can comply with public health recommendations? Like, I mean, well, you could say more broadly, people might feel pressure to come into work even if they are not feeling well. I think this is, is very much an equity issue, and this is what we are encouraging organizations to do, is to look at their, their policies, to look at their sick policies, and be cognizant of the fact that if people are sick and they have either flu-like symptoms or COVID-19 symptoms, that they stay home. We should be encouraging um, employers to advocate for their, for their employees. I, I will say the city of Boston has, has revised their um, employee health um, an employee sick policy specifically because we, do, we don't want people to come to work. And so I think, um, you know, we can work with state legislature, we can work with, um, we can advocate for that. But I think it, it really does behoove private business owners to try and, and be sensible about that as well. Here's a, another very specific question. We, we, we've, we've heard about uh, you know, protocols for washing hands. What about cleaning surfaces? What are the best way to do that? How much should we be concerned about the virus on surfaces? So um, this is a respiratory virus, so it's largely spread by coughing and sneezing. But we do know that viruses can survive on surfaces, and people touch surfaces and then touch their face and mouth and so forth. So cleaning is important. Cleaning surfaces helps. I think the focus on you know, what exactly you clean with is probably not that important, that cleaning with a household cleaner is, is probably a good idea for um, you know, business settings, for, for large um, venues that you know, there are recommendations around certain types of, of sanitizers that are EPA approved. And actually, because coronavirus is similar to what we've talked about actually cause colds and flus and so forth all the time, the so-called community-associated um, respiratory coronaviruses. Um, EPA, there's actually an EPA standard for coronavirus that's built into some cleaning products, and, and we advise the use of those in, in, you know, for the MBTA and the Science Museum and those kinds of places. So, it sounds like it's just as important, if not more, to avoid that face-touching thing as, as much as the surfaces. And hand-washing. Yeah, one thing I was going to say is if, you know, we've given a lot of instructions, there's a lot of instructions on hand-washing. One thing that we do in, our, in my medical unit, um, just to ensure that we have clean surfaces, is first you want to make sure you have all the areas that are busy, doorknobs, you know, uh, remote controls, things that multiple people touch, ensuring that those are cleaned. The second is ensuring you get enough coverage, making sure entire surfaces that you're cleaning are covered. Uh, you're not, you know, the more, you, the more of that surface area you cover, the, the better the chances that you're reducing that. The other is letting whatever product it is dry. It takes time for that product to kill the organism, and so ensuring that it dries out before you use it helps. I just want to echo what you pointed out, which is to touch your face. You know, um, it, it's not the, the surfaces. The surface, if the, if the virus is on a surface and you touch it, the the virus won't permeate your skin. Yeah. It's, it's the fact that you touch the surface and then touch your face. And I was, I was telling my kids to wash their hands before they eat. I mean, that, that adage is really important right now. So as much as you want to rub your nose or rub your face or you know, grab, quickly grab the apple and stick it in your mouth, don't. Uh, another question here. Uh, if, if, after someone who's had a case of coronavirus recovers, are they able to catch it again, or is there a kind of a functional immunity afterwards? Or do we not know? I don't think we know. Um, you know, in fact, we, there, there are only just now tests for immunity that are being developed. We, we are just learning about, um, you know, so-called serologic tests or antibody tests that measure whether somebody has had the infection are going to be very important for understanding circulation in the community and how frequent um, asymptomatic infection is. 
and those tests are really just now being developed and there are none approved currently in the US. So we, don't, we just don't know about immunity to this virus yet or how long it lasts. Um, we can say from other coronaviruses that there probably is long-lasting immunity that's conferred by the disease, and it's one of the reasons we think that vaccines will work. Uh, another specific question. This is from a middle school art teacher uh, who's older than 60 and writes that it's impossible to stay six feet away from students who cough, sneeze, and practice poor hygiene. I can imagine that being the case. Uh, and I can't avoid touching services that students touch. Schools are open. Uh, sh should I stay home? At this time, there's no evidence of community spread. And so we, as public health officials, are doing um, contact, what's called contact investigation, so to identify the person who's sick and the close contact. And therefore, if you're out in, I'll, I'll speak for Boston since I am in Boston. If you are in Boston, I think you need to be aware of your risk as a 60-year-old with medical conditions for infections in general, flu, pneumonia, whatever. Um, so Boston Public Health Commission, public health nurses, this is what they do. We've said this before. This, they um, take into account the risk of infection to, to the community, to close contacts. And right now, we are really speaking about the person who's sick and, the person, uh, and those clo close contacts of that person. Uh, someone writes asking, healthcare is expensive in the U.S. Are, are hospitals planning to waive fees to allow people with financial difficulties to be, to be treated? But more, I guess more, more broadly, you know, for, for people who have a harder time making their co-payments and, and things like that, how, how, how do you address that at the, at the public health level? Again, it's a really important equity issue, right? Um, we're 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 fortunate to live in Massachusetts, where you know, so, where there's really nearly universal health care coverage. Ninety-seven percent or so of the population here has some form of, of health insurance, which is is spectacular and much higher than than most of the country. Um, that being said, there are people who who fall through the cracks. And our government, uh, the, at the state government level, is working to address that issue. We don't want cost to be a barrier to um, being tested or treated for, for COVID infection. Uh, someone writes, we, we've already seen the preparation or practice of remote work from tech leaders in local universities such as MIT. Should businesses and organizations start now to take steps for planning and preparing jobs that don't require an, an in-person presence for Telecommuting. Yes. <laughs> Simple, easy answer. Uh, you know, yes. I think that's one of the social distancing measures that, that we're seeing is that, um, and, and it's it's a pretty easy one for businesses to to take on. There's so much telecommuting and, and work from home that that already happens, and to to increase the ability to do that not only um, helps society by by social distancing and reducing the spread of illnesses, but helps the company by they're you know, maintaining their continuity and um, keeping their own employees safe. I, I will also point out, I, the answer is yes. I think that all organizations should, um, should be aware of their preparedness plans. But I also think organizations need to be aware of the workers who can't telecommute. How are they going to be? You know, how can we support them? I think of, of facilities personnel who, who have to come in and out. And often these are the, the part of the population who, you know, need that paycheck to pay their rent and to eat. And so how are organizations also supporting those people who can't necessarily telecommute and what, what's the preparedness in place to address their needs as well? And, and another group that's, I think, important that can't telecommute is healthcare workers. And a lot of hospitals are actually working on coming up with surge capacity plans in terms of if you have scenarios where people get exposed um, or get sick, how do we backfill that and ensure that people continue to get quality of care? Uh, have, have you seen any uh, issues with, you know, we've heard about stores being cleared out of, of you know, uh, breathing air filter masks, uh, hand sanitizer, things like that. Um, are you seeing any, any problems from over, overreactions? that affect you in terms of dealing with public health? Uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll. 
Sorry. Uh, so I think that there is an impact on access to um, personal protective equipment and, and masks. And I know that um, uh, the governor announced a, a request for, for funding to increase um, personal protective equipment. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to speak for Massachusetts. This was at a press conference that we were both at the other day. So it's, but I mean, I, I do think that there is, um, we're trying to prevent a stress on our um, resources at the healthcare level. And, and one of the messages about not using face masks, that is specifically so that we don't utilize face masks for situations that they are not warranted so that there will be enough supplies for when they are warranted. Can you talk about how the, there's an awful lot of things to coordinate here in terms of a, a public health re response because we're, we've talked about, say, dealing with uh, private institutions, public institutions, some are service industries, some, some are not. We're dealing with universities, private and public schools as, as, as well. How on earth do you manage the coordination of, of, of all of that? <laughs> right. Um, it, it is challenging, and you're right that almost every type of organization, every you know, including the general public, would would like sort of guidance and and, and specific guidance oriented towards them. Um, we're really fortunate that the um, our, our federal partners do produce a lot of guidance that's specific to different kinds of organizations, and and we can't possibly mirror all of those, and so those are available. I will mention that um, the Department of Public Health has a great website, uh, mass.gov slash COVID-19, which has a lot of that kind of information available and available to different kinds of groups, specific guidance for um, emergency medical personnel, for healthcare workers, for schools, um, you know, you can just imagine for businesses, um, different kinds of, of guidance that's out there. And of course, it, it changes as our awareness and knowledge changes, so we have to keep all of that up to date. So stay tuned and check reliable sources. I'll also just add, um, just in reference to what Larry had said um, earlier, is that we are, we are not working with people that we've ne never met before. Uh, uh, Boston Public Health Commission has a long relationship with DPH as well as um, Boston University, BMC, and um, the contacts at universities, they all have our, maybe not my personal direct number, but the infectious disease, um, phone number at um, BPHD as well as DPH. So, so although this seems um, amplified, we have been working on, we've been preparing for these coordination and it is, it is difficult, but at least we have the infrastructure already in place to make that a little bit easier. Larry, you, you used the phrase a moment ago, uh, we need to turn to reliable sources. And, and again, that, that's been something that's more challenging about the, this, uh, the, this public health situation. Um, leaving aside for a moment the national and international scene, where do folks turn here for reliable information about, about best practices, what to do? I mean, once they leave here today, because things are going to change. So I've mentioned a, a, a couple um, already. Certainly, um, the uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health website does have good information out there. Um, our, our Centers for Disease Control has very good information. I think even Google has become better at directing people who, who, who search online towards, initially at least in their top search results, towards reliable sources of information. I mentioned ProMed earlier, which is a good source of sort of global emerging infectious disease types of information. Um, and reliable media um, outlets, uh, reliable um, news outlets are also so important um, in, in getting the word out. I'll add as well that um, our BPHC website, mass.gov, as well as cdc.gov, they post information and they will date and time uh, the information that is posted. And so that's, we are trying to provide up-to-date information, relevant information as it comes out. And so that can help you be aware of, of when the information is available. I'll also just to plug bphc.org. Um, we actually have a lot of fact sheets and information in other languages, so if you um, know of community members who, um, I'm gonna miss all the languages, Chinese, Portuguese, Vietnamese, Haitian Creole, Spanish, 
English. I think that's all of them. So, so that's one of the, the ways, how do we get the word out to our community members and, and those that don't speak English? Um, there are resources for them on the website. I lost the app. Could, you, uh, could somebody help me get the app back up? Um, thank you. The, um, what is, uh, as, this, as this disease moves forward and we're thinking about you know, dealing with individuals who have the disease, how once someone is infected, is, is, there, is there treatment? Are, are, there, is there, are there ways to, uh, you know, treatments or, or therapies to help the person out if, if not cure them? Yeah, um, as I mentioned, we're still working on targeted treatments. So treatments specifically against the virus itself are still, those are th still things that develop, need more development. But there actually already are steps that doctors take when someone comes in when we don't have targeted therapy. So one is we try to control the symptoms, make the person more comfortable, depending on the symptoms that they're having. Two, we, we support the person's body as their own immune system fights this infection. We provide what we call supportive care. Um, you know, if their lungs are if they're having trouble breathing or you know, if their kidneys are not working as well as they should. Um, and, and third, um, what we're discovering is in some of the cases that were um, seen in some of the other countries, people may get secondary infections. So they might get a bacterial infection in their lungs while they're dealing with this, this uh, pneumonia, viral pneumonia. And so we would treat them with antibiotics. So yeah, a lot of steps, but of course the targeted therapy is what we're really all looking for as well. I, I, I just want to add, and we've, we've touched on this a little, is that um, for the overwhelming majority of people who, who contract COVID-19, um, it's a mild, self-limited illness. Um, they don't need health care. They can take care of themselves at home like they would for a cold or flu and will get better spontaneously. It's only if you're at high risk or you have uh, complications or you're getting very sick from this illness that you need health care or therapy. And uh, Larry and, and Jennifer also, how does the chain of command work? Say you're a physician, uh, you have someone in your office, you they're showing all, all, all the signs. Uh, where do you call to get the test? Or like, how, how do things work from, from that point? So, so for most diseases, and soon to be for this disease, a clinician can order a test that they think is, is indicated or, or necessary to diagnose or, or treat a patient. Um, in, for some of these very new emerging diseases, that kind of testing is only available you know, in, in, in certain ways. And so currently, as of today, that testing is only available through the state public health laboratory or through the CDC. And in that case, a, a, a clinical provider needs to contact their health department, either their local health department, in the case of, uh, of Boston or, or whatever locality they're in, or the state health department directly. And that happens all the time. Coronaviruses are reportable diseases. So like many infectious diseases, they're reportable, um, that required to be reported to the health department. And, and practitioners and hospitals and, and healthcare systems know how to do that. In, in terms of a legal matter as personal freedoms, uh, is there a state at, at which, you know, say, I'm infected, I'm showing all the symptoms, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to quarantine myself. I'm just going to go out. At what point could the state say, uh, no, you need to be quarantined. We're going to make sure you are. So people are, are generally terrific about this and understand that they, they don't want to infect their friends and neighbors, and, 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 and they, they, they um, voluntarily uh, allow quarantine to happen or isolation to happen. Um, in, in, those, in those rare instances where that doesn't happen, there are legal mechanisms that, that, that can allow the state, the local um, health authorities in, in concert with the state government to enforce quarantine. And going ab above the state level, how, because as, as, as you mentioned at, at the outset of this, um, we're talking about what's happening at the local level, but this is a disease which comes from around the world. The rest of the world, the rest of the country, obviously, has an impact on how we are dealing with this. How, how do you coordinate with the federal authorities? And, and yeah, I mean, like, I know you, you've worked in international cases before, like beyond our own government, even, to, to keep track of what you need to keep track of with this. I would just say we're, we, we talk with 
Boston, we talk with the local health authorities, we talk with um, CDC many times a day um, during the course of this outbreak. So this is something that, that, that we do you know, just regularly. It's something we do all the time anyway, dealing with routine diseases. There are reporting systems, there is regular coordination with, with our partners all the time. But in a, in a sort of a, a ramped up situation like we're, we're seeing here, it becomes even more so that we really do have very frequent phone calls. Um, I, I, can't, I, I can't tell you how many hours a week I've, I spend on calls with, um, with various partners. At the international level, the World Health Organization actually serves the t as the technical partner that works with many different countries to try to align best practices and to share information. And in terms of the information out there, um, well, let, let, let me ask you uh, to play media critic. You got a reporter here, you, you can beat up on me. What are some of the things in terms of getting the information out there that uh, we could do better? Um, so the first thing I would say is that we absolutely depend on the news media in public health. We, we can't reach the people that the media can reach and um, we, we really rely on partners in, in the media and, and there are so many good ones who, who do a tremendous job of reporting on public health issues. Um, you know, our, our local partners at, 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 at your station at, and, 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 and public radio in general, but, but the news radio stations as well, and certainly our, our, our print media, the Boston Globe has been an, a, a outstanding. Um, Stat News is an internationally recognized um, uh, standard, I think, in terms of reporting on, on public health events. So we, we really need the news media, and we, we, we're glad that you are there to help us get important messages out. Of course, there, we don't like everything that we, we read, and there are sources that, that are, are not as good, and um, I think it's important for the, an informed public to be aware of that and to, to pay attention to reliable sources. Yeah, I have a little bit more leeway, right, because I'm a private citizen. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the two things that I wish the media would do is um, avoid sensationalizing it because sometimes, particularly in our world, the attention on the television or on the screen or on the computer doesn't come unless you really do these, you know, dramatic headlines. And now is the time for moderation and, and really, you know, media to be a partner to share um, what public health folks are saying. Um, in a way that's even handed in and really giving the information that's needed rather than trying to make a news story out of it. And we saw that during the Ebola epidemic as well. You know, the average person <laughs> during 2014 to 2016 in the United States was not at any risk for Ebola. And that was all you saw in the news media was, you know, the fear of Ebola. And, uh, the second bit, I think, is it's very difficult for all of us to deal with uncertainty. We talked about the fact that every hour there is more information that's coming out. Um, and so I think one of the other things that media can help us because they're so good at communicating with, with the, the general public is um, how, do we, um, how do we ensure the public that there are systems in place that are going to kick in, but at the same time um, become a bit more comfortable with that uncertainty, you know, uh, scientific uncertainty, if you will, not so much a public health uncertainty. I appreciate a forum like this because it isn't around a specific um, recent press release or a recent piece of information. It's really about facts. And I think to both of your points, um, the, the media and, and organization, public health organizations and health organizations can really work together to get facts, information as opposed to so proactive as, a, as opposed to reactive. I also just want to add that museums are part of that, and uh, we're really grateful to the to Science Museum. This is, I, I grew up around here, and some of my happiest childhood moments were spent uh, in this museum. Uh, some of my childhood friends are here, actually. And um, I, I think museums really play an important educational role, and fora like this are important. So some more kind of specific nuts and bolts questions uh, here. Um, and this goes to uh, people asking about when, when should schools consider closing down? And also the questions about, say, boarding schools or camps that are commun communal living situations, which might seem to somebody, you know, that, that would be a, 
uh, a place to avoid at, 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 at times like this. How, when, when do you make the call and how do you make the call on, on that? I, I think each of, um, each of these institutions should be looking at their preparedness plans right now and thinking about the different situations that can occur, the different um, situations that might cause them to make that decisions. And we are very, um, we coordinate, we are happy to coordinate with those organizations. So again, I'm from, from Boston, we coordinate with Boston Public Schools and make decisions based on, on what can keep the, um, it, the public safe in those in organizations. And I know uh, DPH does the same. So I think it's, it's a matter of planning Right now, again, I'm going to reiterate, we're not advising, and the public health is not advising any closures of schools. But again, when the situation changes, if, you, if the schools and the institutions have those, those plans in place, then we can have a conversation and move towards the decision that best works for the public health as well as the health of their organiz individual organizations. Sorry, I just lost my place. Um, when um, people are asking about, we've seen in other places where there have been outbreaks, other states that are declaring a state states of emergency in, in California, uh, New York. What would it take here to trigger a state of emergency, and what would be useful about having a state of emergency to to, to deal with a, a public health issue like this? I, I'm. It wouldn't be me that would declare a state of emergency, <laughs> so I would have to defer to, uh, to, to people at higher levels of government to, to answer that question. Uh, people are asking about advice about air travel. Air travel. Is, is that a bad situation to, to be in, on an airplane, recirculated air, close among people? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we were just having this conversation because I am getting so many messages from friends, you know, um, from friends of friends, from patients about this, about travel. And one of the things that I advise them is it really is an individual risk assessment, right? How important is your trip? How long is the trip? What is your medical condition? Uh, where are you going? Um, and what is the transmission? Where are you coming from and where you're going? And, and taking all of those things into account when you make that decision. As has been mentioned before, aside from the five countries that the CDC has identified as having category two or three risk, um, there really are no current recommendations for stopping travel. So it really is a decision that you and your family have to, to make together. At what point does, is a decision made to quarantine an area, to, to say, make, you know, this is the time to close the school, this is the time to restrict tab travel to an entire area? Right. Um, you know, one of the things we can't do very well is predict the future. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's something that we assess all the time, every day, think about and try to, try to make decisions to protect the public health. As, as, as I said earlier, there are a number you know, there's a, a, an approach that starts with simple things that everybody can do and progresses to things like work from home policies to, you know, um, limiting travel in certain ways and, and, and that then, you know, then more advanced social distancing and, and community mitigation measures take place. It's something, it's a conversation that we, we, we are having on an ongoing basis. Uh, someone asks, my husband and I both have autoimmune disorders. If one of us did get the virus, what should the other person do to safeguard themselves? So um, autoimmune disorder is, is a condition that puts you at a high risk category. Um, and at this point in time, close contact, so a case is positive and will receive treatment. A close contact will be monitored, monitored daily on a regular basis on a regular basis by public health nurses to ensure that they have support in um, um, ensuring that they do not develop diseases or can, and at least get them connected to care as soon as um, uh, symptoms present. And so, I mean, I think back to Nate's earlier uh, comment, which is do everything you can to stay healthy now. Um, that's really the main individual treatment is to, to keep healthy as much as possible. Another cost question, if, if someone does have the, uh, the coronavirus test, uh, 
Does insurance pay for it, or does the state pay for it? So, so the testing that's done at the state lab is free, or free to the consumer. It obviously is costly to, uh, to, 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 the, state, to the state, but it's free to the consumer. Um, if and when commercial testing becomes available, it's going to be like other kinds of laboratory testing, and it's going to be between the, uh, you know, the healthcare system and the insurer and the patient to, to, to sort of walk through that. I know that our, our state government is working on trying to, to facilitate that so that there shouldn't be a cost to people who, who need testing or treatment for coronavirus. Uh, I know you've answered this question before, but we haven't specifically talked about it here. People are asking about the, the, the breathing masks, uh, the, the, the air filter masks. Do they do any good? When should you use them? Yeah, I, so the air filter masks, the, the N95s you might have heard of, those are, in, in the healthcare setting, for example, for a healthcare worker to use that, we need to, be, uh, we need to go through a testing called fit testing. We specifically need to be fitted with a type of mask, and um, that's when it's effective. It's, we know we've been trained how to use it, and we've been fitted by size, and that's what makes it protective to us. Um, the concern that, you know, I think you might see, it's not just, you know, the, the idea that we should reserve it for the healthcare setting or, or people who are sick or anything along those lines. But in my experience, one of the things that I've noticed is people put on the mask and their nose is outside their mask. Have you guys seen that, right? Or, or they lift it up and they're trying to drink from a straw from, from the Dunkin' Donuts coffee that you know, they currently have. Or a lot of times you have something on your face and you reach up because it's uncomfortable and you move it around and inadvertently you're touching your face with your hands, which is exactly what you don't want to do. Um, so I, I, I think that there are certain instances in the pub public setting where it might be effective, which is um, you are sick and, 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 and you don't, you want to keep, you want to stay at home, but you want to try to keep um, others from getting sick if you are outside for a little bit of time. But in the most, in most settings, if you are not sick, you're actually increasing your chances. In my only personal experience, I've not seen data on this, people reach out and touch their faces. Uh, more likely for you to just clean your hands and, and make sure the surfaces you touch are clean. That helps you more. If, uh, someone asks about uh, water parks, public water attractions, such as pools or, or, or water parks. I, I don't think any of us really know the answer to that question. Sorry. Uh, someone asked about uh, if their parents are in their late 70s, uh, if they have uh, health issues or immune issues, does that mean that you should self-quarantine? How much should you stay out of public? So, so, so right now, we don't think there's a substantial risk of, of coronavirus in the community, right? There's not, you know, a lot of it wandering around and, and for someone to be exposed to. Um, were that to become the case, um, that it, that, that's a, something that we would address, is whether people who have high-risk conditions should stay home or out of crowded places. And I think that is something that we would, we would think about. But we're not, we're not there right now. Um, and, and just to remind people that there, there are many um, contagious infectious diseases that are circulating right now that those 70-year-olds are also at risk for and, and need to be aware of. So I would just, you know, put the risk in context. Uh, people have been asking about, and this is also another area where there's been some controversy, uh, about what the status is of finding a vaccine for, for this illness. Um, but first, I, I think in terms of timetable, maybe you want to talk about how realistic a timetable would be for something like that? So, so um, again, this has been an, an unprecedented um, outbreak in the sense that um, the, the, the pathogen has been identified, the nu nucleotide sequence, the genetic sequence of the virus um, publicized and made, made available. Um, there's a vaccine manufacturer here in Massachusetts which has developed a, a, a vaccine actually based on, on the genetic sequence of the virus and has really already um, put a, a prototype um, out to what's called a phase one clinical trial. Um, vaccines and, and other drugs actually need to go through a, a series of clinical trials before they're made available um, on a large basis. So there's a phase one trial, which is just kind of initial safety testing. 
um, a phase two trial where the dosing and, and, and initial immune response to a vaccine is determined, and then phase three clinical trials where vaccines are used in a, in a, in a clinical setting to try to see whether they work, whether they actually prevent the disease. And we, what we've heard is that phase one trials are about to begin, but, but to get from you know, the prototype of a vaccine, the, the bench research behind a vaccine, to actually having it in clinical use typically is at least 18 months. And even you know, if we really try to accelerate, it's hard to envision that being less than a year away. Um, and that would be an optimistic scenario. There are numerous prototypes that are, that are out there that are, are, are being pursued and are in different stages of, of trial. But the, the, and finally, um, once, even once a vaccine gets through phase three, it needs to be manufactured in huge numbers, right? Because this is something that the whole world is presumably at risk for. And so to get from you know, having a, a product to being able to mass produce it and distribute it to millions of people is a challenge. As, as for people dealing with this on the ground, the public health right now, this is not something that's around the corner at all, that you're, is a factor for you that you're thinking about, right? Today. Yes, today. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, we're coming up on, on the end of the time we have here, and I, something that I always want to ask is, uh, are there questions about this that we didn't ask you, that I didn't ask you, that, that uh, you really want to take a moment to um, tell people now that we have this public forum here. <laughs> I think there's, you know, I, I've, I've, people have asked me, like, how worried should I be? How much should I prepare? And I, and I, I truly think there is a reality between not preparing at all and, and, you know, doing crazy stuff like emptying out all the shelves from Costco and, you know, making sure you have an entire den that feeds you for six months. In between probably is the reality of what we should be doing, which is I think that we need to prepare that there might be more cases. Um, we need to prepare that our family members may get sick if, if there are more cases and how are we gonna take care of them if we ourselves have to quarantine or if we have people who are sick in our house. Um, and so ensuring again, you get med your medical refills, that you have some symptom control medication around the house, that you just have enough food that if you get sick, you don't have to go to the grocery store um, to, to get more food or go to the pharmacy to get those medications. I think that's, that's the level of you know, preparedness that I would say is probably appropriate right now. Would you guys agree with that? Really uh, Larry, uh, Jennifer, I want to get closing thoughts from you as well, but can I squeeze in one more specific question? We got uh, someone is asking, uh, can domestic animals uh, be carriers? <laughs> Say dogs or, yeah. or cats? <laughs> Do we know? We don't know the answer to that is the simple, the simple question. Um, we think that this disease probably originated from an animal, but that species hasn't been identified. There's been one report I read about a dog that was tested positive for the virus. I don't think we, we think or anybody thinks that dogs are commonly involved in this transmission or that that's something that we need to worry about right now. Sorry, back to your concluding thoughts. Um, I wanted to point out that I, I think, you know, we emphasize social isolation, um, avoiding gathering places. I also want to emphasize that we are humans and crave human interaction and depend on each other as a community. And I think at this stage in the game, I think we can be cognizant of our health, but also care for each other. I, I think if you have an elderly person that maybe not have resources, knock on the door, check up on them, see if they need something. I have mentioned vulnerable populations. There are a number of people who work in industries where they don't have sick leave, and this is very fearful for them. So if they don't get a paycheck, if they can't come to work because the, the, you know, their business shuts down, they are nervous that they won't have food. And so I think being aware of those populations, of course, we're fearful for ourselves, but we are also fearful for our neighbors and we are a caring community. So just how do we address that and how can we be helpful to others but still protect our families? Thank you. Larry? Um, I, I think the idea that we need to be prepared, that we need to um, be aware of what's going on around us, um, that we need to maintain a, a certain amount of vigilance and, and awareness 
but, but not panic is important. And um, it's very hard to modulate that, right? It's very hard to be aware, to be concerned, to hear these constant um, news reports um, and maintain a level of awareness, and also not to, to sort of burn out from it. There's a, there's a danger that there's a lot of hype and then we become complacent, and, and that's something that we want to avoid also. So awareness, don't panic, and, and know your neighbors. Sounds like a good, good theme to end on. Be kind to each other. There's a good one. Thank you all so much. This, this has been a real, real treat to uh, be able to ask you all these questions. Thank all of you. Thanks to the Museum of Science. Uh, this was terrific. Thanks very much. And I want to thank you on behalf of the museum for your time and your expertise. And to the community, I'd like to say that we're posting all of this on MOS.com coronavirus. And also, you can find it on WGBH.com. And I'd like to thank, once again, our museum Dot team, org. WGBH, <laughs> Arun Roth, our panelists. And as you go, please know, this is going to change. Even as you walk out of this room, things will change. Tomorrow, it will change. Mountains of data are going to come in. So as you go, I hope that we all will turn our minds to the facts before us, not the hysteria, to our wills to do what the evidence suggests, and then as time goes on, to our neighbors and to our community, and not just to ourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs>